uh, these mechanical properties of matter talk about mainly the different materials we know in life. We all know different materials. We have our bodies, that is a different material. So the skin, the skin of our body is also elastic. Otherwise, if it wasn't elastic, if a pregnant woman gives birth, her stomach would have remained big forever. If also us, some of us who eat food very well and we grow big stomachs, if we don't work out, our skins wouldn't be going back to make maybe flat berries or three, six packs and the like. So the moment people can build that such bodies, it means their bodies are elastic or their skins are elastic. Uh, the same applies to rubber bands. You've seen rubber bands. Yeah. You've seen rubber bands, they're elastic. And rubber is more elastic because of the reasons. It has two types of molecules. One, it has coiled molecules. So the molecules pass down coil, then the molecules extend as well. That's why rubber extends further or most than any other material. If you look at glass, glass is brittle. They easily break when a force is applied on them. Behind me is a glass, so it's brittle. If you've seen dry wood, dry wood is also brittle. It easily breaks. Clay is also brittle. Chalk is brittle. So those are all examples of brittle items. Then we have other materials which are ductile, which include metals, which include uh, wires, nails, those ones, they can be bent, molded, shaped into other shapes without break. Okay. So someone is in the chat already. In which books are you writing? Mechanics, guys, this is mechanics. The mechanics you have in math, once you're studying it, this side in physics, still mechanics in physics. So by definitions, you can see that we have what we call strength. Have you had people say the strength of a woman yeah. Now you hear the definition. The ability of a material to withstand or to resist the applied force before such a material breaks is what we call the strength. So when they say a strength of a woman, it means a woman is strong enough to withstand all challenges she can face. She can withstand the pain and then give birth. She can withstand the nine months. That's why they say strength of a woman. So some of these um, definitions are related to our day-to-day experiences. So a material is said to be strong, or we say it has good strength, if it can withstand or resist an applied force before it breaks. Yeah. So by the time you break a woman, that woman has suffered or has been in position to withstand so many challenges. Then second, we have stiffness. Something stiff means it has an ability to resist change in shape or size i.e. stability of the material to resist being bent. Examples of such materials, some metals are stiff. Chalk is also stiff. Chalk does not allow you to bend it, okay? Then we have what we call ductility. These are still abilities, but if they say ductile, it is now a material. Well, ductility is the ability of what? Of the ductile material to behave the way the ductility definition states. So it's the bit of a material to be hammered, bent, or rolled into different shapes. You get a piece of iron, you bend it, you mold it into a box. You bend it, you mold it into a nail. You bend it, you mold it into a panel. So it is ductile. So that is what we call ductility. Brittleness. Brittleness, materials or substances bend very little and break suddenly. Yeah? They suddenly crack without any warning when a force is applied on them. When you look at glass, if you see glass breaking for a car, it breaks and you see so many small particles picked up. It's because examples like glass have tracks within them. And those tracks are weak points that combine the glass with particles. So when a force is applied on the, on the tracks in glass, the force can go through entire tracks of the glass and the glass can easily brush into those small particles that you normally see. Then we have another definition there, which is elasticity. This is the ability of a material to regain its original length, size, or shape when the applied force has been removed. This rubber band has this original shape. When I put it, it extends. When I release it, it 
goes back to its original shape and size. So it is experiencing elasticity. Why? Because it can be able to get deformed and then go back to its original shape and size. So, with those definitions, uh, when a tensile force is applied on the material, the material stretches due to its particles being pulled further apart from one another. As a result, extension is produced. Now, the extension produced depends on the size of the force, that is according to Hooke's law, the nature of the material, which is normally the force constant, three, the original length you had, four, the cross section area of the material whereby thin materials big produce longer extensions and thick materials produce shorter extensions. If this is my original size of the rubber band, when I put it, this is how far I can stop. That is the thickness is big. Now, what if I reduce the thickness? What if I reduce the thickness? If I cut this rubber band, it's very hard. Now, I have changed the thickness, it's no longer as big as it was before. You see that I can pull this further away. And almost my entire chest is covered because now the thickness has become small. The other one, the thickness was big, so it couldn't extend so much. So now, because of the small thickness, we can extend it as far as possible. So, Hooke's law states that the extension produced in a wire is always directly proportional to the force that you have applied. That me to extend this rubber band. If I apply a small force, it extends slowly. And some length this is short. I apply a bigger force, it extends further. I reduce the force, the extension reduces. So Hooke's law states that the force that you apply to an elastic material is directly proportional to the extension that you will produce, provided you have not yet exceeded its elastic limit. And the elastic limit is how far it can be elastic or how far the molecules can allow the deforming force act on them without losing their electrostatic, their, their elastic potential energy, as we shall see. So with that definition, we can talk about the following. Hooke's law, which has said that force is directly proportional to extension. And with this, the force is equal to Ke. That is why I've said it is depending on extension, the force applied, and then the nature of the material. The nature of the material is predicted by the force constant K. The force constant K is what predicts the nature of the material that you are using. Now, with that, uh, you can see some of these images. I have the images here. I don't have the images today. Okay. Uh, we have some few images here. I was illustrating using a rubber band. And still, the same aspect is being talked about here for the rubber band. You can see it. You've seen these elastic balls. Plastic poles, you press them, they get compressed, you release them, they expand. Okay. Um, you see that spring can extend. Whoever has never seen an elastic material, just yes, get, for example, I have my t shirt here. I put it, it extends, I release it, flat back on my body, meaning it is elastic. We all put on items which are elastic in the waist. The ladies put on knickers, which are elastic. The boys put on pants or boxers, which are also elastic. So they also have elastic material in them. That is why they can extend for you to fit in. So still physics is applied in those aspects of dressing. That's why I always tell people everywhere you see there is physics. And whatever we do, as long as the items are being made by man. So I uh, can go back to where we were. have further our definitions. Then we have what we call a graph of extension. 
Again, it's force for a material that is uh, ductile. And this ductile material, uh, this graph needs some more editing. Okay, this is extension again, it's force. I'm going to show you another one, of course, again, it's extension. Uh, force again, it's extension looks like this. So of course, again, this extension will have something like that. Then it will have something of this sort. Whereby this is point A. Now this is post. This is extension. So this is the elastic limit. This is the proportionate limit. We have the yield point, we have plastic deformation, and then at point E, the material breaks. So if you draw a reverse of the same graph, whereby the reverse is going to look like this. In the case you have extension versus force, then for extension versus force has this kind of shape, which is in the notes here. So I'll also send the other notes which are written. So this is what we have down here in the notes as per what is written. This one, this curve you have, the extension again is force. While the other is force against extension. So they can ask you for any. Right? Whereby, if you label it very well, you will see that uh, this is point O. Remember, I showed you point A, proportional limit, where hooks no stops, elastic limit, yield point, deformation, plastic deformation, and then breaking point. Now, still, this also has an explanation. They can ask me to explain the graph, its max. Whereby from O, let me use what was sketched token. Okay. Uh, from O, what I've sketched from O to A, Hooke's law is being obeyed. That is, the force is directly proportional to the extension. Then from A to B, the material extends but does not recover its original length. So it means between B and A, there is no hook slope being obeyed, but we have obeyed hook slope from O up to A. So that is why we are saying proportionate limit stops at proportionate limit stops at A, while the extension limit stops at B. It extends up to B, but it is not proportional to the force applied, and it cannot recover its original shape and size. So hook slope stops at A, but still the material can extend. But when it extends, it will never recover its original shape and size. So with that, when you uh, see beyond B and C, between B and C, uh, you see that we have, um, that is where I've called the point B, the elastic limit. Now, when you reach point C, point C is where we have the yield point, okay? And at the yield point, the material extends and now starts becoming plastic. When it starts becoming plastic, plastic deformation takes place until it reaches point D, when all the material is now plastic. And if it has all become plastic at D, then any extra force you add on it is going to break the material at E. So that is what this interpretation of the graph predicts. So I'll also send a more write-up on this, which is in terms of notes, so that you can have it. Okay. Now it is from here. Uh, uh, sorry, I couldn't have this. Um... Teacher. Yes, please. May you please repeat again because you were freezing. Yeah, I was freezing. Okay, first, hold on. Uh, let me get out. Uh, use some other venue. Okay, 
So can you hear me very well, okay? Yes, teacher. Okay, so I was saying, I want me to repeat on the what, on the graph, eh? Yes, teacher. Okay, let me sketch the graph. This one, discard it. I will send you a better graph from the notes, okay? So I was saying, if we have a graph like this one, and this graph has a shape of this kind. This is a force. This is extension. And I've said, if you move along the straight line up to point A, point A is what we call the proportionate limit. So point A is the proportional limit where proportionality stops okay that is where proportionality stops then we have point b where elasticity stops we have point c which is the yield point we have point d where we have the plastic deformation taking place then we have lastly point e where the material breaks from now i was saying between o and a the material extends as a result of the force applied and the extension produced, meaning it is satisfying Hooke's law. So at point A, that's where Hooke's law stops. Now beyond the point A, we do not have Hooke's law anymore, but the material still extends to point B. So point B is what we call the elastic limit. It extends, but it is not proportional to the force applied. Meaning if you remove the force, the material can never regain its original shape and size. But when you remove the force from A, the material will regain because it is falling hook slow. So at A, when hook slow is done, and you go to point B and you extend the material, the material cannot recover its original shape and size. So at point B, we just have an elastic limit, but we do not have proportionality taking place. Then when you increase the force further, the material is going to become, now it's no longer becoming elastic because it has stopped el being elastic. So it is going to become deformed until it reaches the yield point, whereby now it starts becoming plastic. So elastic deformation ends here. Elastic deformation ends here at C, then plastic deformation starts. So when plastic deformation has been experienced at D, the entire material is now plastic. If you have ever got a metal and, um, and bent it more, multiple times, time comes when that part where you're bending becomes thin, hot, and soft, and it becomes brittle. It becomes brittle, or you get a material and hit the metal very much. Normally, the wires for a hanger, if you have a hanger at home, if there is one which is spoiled, eh? Use that one, twist it multiple times and see, time will come when it will thin out or get a straw and put it. The straw will thin out, become a little hot, becomes plastic and any other extra force that you add will make the straw or the wire break at point E, okay? So I said they can ask you to explain this entire graph and they can ask you and give you six marks for that. So I will send a better write up on these explanations because uh, Mr. Kauma never do a sketch which is very appropriate. Now, it is from there that we went ahead and saw what we call uh, tensile stress and tensile strain, whereby stress is got from force by unit cross-sectional area, whereas strain is got from extension by unit original length. So if you have a wire like this one, whose original length was L and has extended by E, then stress is going to be the force you've applied divided by the cross-sectional area. Whereas strain, sometimes you call it tensile strain, it's going to be extension out of the original length. Now with this, one can be positioned to get this formula right 
and you can even deduce their SI units and standard and uh, and, uh, and what and dimension. Furthermore, we have also what we call the Young's modulus. Most of these we have seen in all levels. Young's modulus is the ratio of tensile stress to tensile strain, meaning. You can get the ratio of Young's modulus is normally Y. It's the same as stress out of strain. And it has the same units as stress because strain has no unit. So this is the same as force out of area divided by extension out of original length. And it will give us force times length out of AE, which is the extension. And uh, more so, one can also look at it in a different form. Uh, if you look at, uh, you shall see Young's modulus expressed in terms of uh, work done per unit volume. Yeah. Because work done is length times width. Yeah. First times length, this is work done. Out of area times extension. This is the area extended for the cross-section area, which is the volume of the extended part. So this is the same as work done by unit what? By unit volume. So you'll find a definition talking about that ahead of the notes. Now, if you look at this example, it talks about a material of skill whose density is given weighing 16 grams, having a length of 250 centimeters. Its length lengthens by 1.2 millimeters when stretched by a force of 80 newtons. I check the Young's modulus of elasticity of steel. Now they give you such a question and you cannot be in position to identify whatever you need to use in the equation. So it means you have to extract it from the knowledge that has been shared. Now, according to that question, we don't have one cross section area. The original length is also not defined, but we can get them. So, because we have density 7800, mass is 16 times 10 power negative 3, the original length is 0 0.25, sorry, it's 2.5 meters. The extension is 1.2 times 10 power negative 3. The force is 8. They say find the Young's modulus. First of all, you don't have the area. Okay? Now, area can be got from uh, the volume divided by the length. Volume can be got from mass out of the density, which is 16 times 10 power negative 3 divided by 7, 800. Then you can get the volume. When you get that volume, area can be got from 2.5. I mean, the volume you have got. Uh, did Mr. Kaoma get the volume? No. He substituted everything matched together. But when you compute, what volume do you get? <laughs> Two point zero five times ten to the power negative six. Two point zero five exponent negative six. Negative six. So can you find the area divided by the length, which is uh, two point five? Eight point two exponent negative. Mm 
8.2 exponent negative 7. So when you get the area, we have seen Young's modulus. Okay, this one was called E. Young's modulus is force, which is 80 times the length, 2.5, divided by the cross section area, 8.2 times 10 power negative 7 times the extension, 1.2 times 10 power negative 3. What answer do you get? Young's modulus. Two point zero three exponent exponent eleven. You get two point zero three times ten to the power eleven. Okay, which is the same as the answer, which is here. So here, Mister Mister Kauma merged all the items together, came up with one formula, formula, and then substituted at once. Then energy stored, uh, energy stored, this book, when you look at it carefully, some pages are missing because of the advancement uh, technique and so that people don't steal the entire book. So I need to take you through how we derive the energy equation. So I can use one of the sides of these pages or I can go back to the white page, but still I'll come back when this one has erased. Let me derive it from here. Now you know that energy or work done when a material has been stretched through a small distance delta x, then the work you do is equal to the force and the small distance x you covered. Whereby the total work done will be the integral from zero up to displacement x of f dx, but f is equal to kx, where x is the extension. So I'll have total work done as the integral from zero to x of kx dx. Now with this, we can be in position to integrate and we shall have one over two k of x from zero up to x when this is squared. So by integration, this is a half k x squared. Then that is the elastic potential energy. Or it's what we call energy in elastic spring. Sometimes you can split it to a half k e times e. Then some books will show you that energy is a half of the force times the extension. Okay. Then there is also another technique of using the graph to derive that equation. You can also use the graph. If I use the graph, this is what I'm going to experience. When I use the graph, I'll consider a graph. And then I find the area under the graph. So the area under this graph, I'm assuming the graph runs up to that point. In that sense, we move from whereby this is force, this is extension. So the area under the graph is equal to the total energy. The total energy, all work done, equal to the area under the graph. Because first times distance, I mean, first times distance is work done. So for that sense, you will see that the area under the graph, since this is a triangle, is going to be a half pH, which is a half of the extension here, X times the force. Times the force 
So there for the work done, what the elastic potential energy will be a half of F, F, X. But since we have already seen F is KX, still it will give you a half KX what? Squared, which is the same as this one. The same as a half F, X. So from that knowledge, when they ask for energy stored in the wire, that is why you see energy stored, we are using this equation. So energy stored in the wire, we can one find its constant K, but because you don't have the constant, if you don't want to use it using this method, then go ahead and use a half Fe. So we have already seen that we have the force, which is 80. We have the extension, which is 1.2 times 10 power negative three. You can compute and get the answer, which is going to be 48 times 10 power negative three, which is 4.8 times 10 power negative three joules, which is the same as one. So these equations are basically very simple and very easy to go through, especially if you have uh, been in position discuss some mechanics in math, and now you're here for physics. But basically having those priority definitions I've talked about. Now take a look at this second number. There is a vertical wire 350 centimeters long. But why should I read? Someone should read for us. Mariam, read the question. Mariam, are you there? Mariam is not sent. Dorothy, read the question. Saul, is your sound okay? Those girls maybe don't know how to unmute. Saul, we can read question two. Uh, I've got a wire. I get in short that. Yes, we are getting you right. Yeah. A vertical wire of 350 centimeters long, diameter of 0 0.1 centimeter, has a load of 8.5 kg applied at its lower end. If it's young as modulus is. So I have not given the young as modulus. If it's young as modulus is what? Calculate. Calculate. I think there's an error there. Uh, Young's motors must have been two exponent eleven. Okay, two exponent eleven. Let's calculate the one extension of the wire, then two energy stored in the wire. Okay. Hope all of you can see my picture. Right. Now this is the material. This is the wire that has been tied on the material. This is before extension. When I release it, it extends. If I bring it back, it goes back. Look at the length. When I release, it extends. So this is what is being displayed in that question. So we have a wire whose diameter is 0 0.1 centimeters. Its original length was 350. Now it has changed. The load, this load we have attached, this is a stone. It is 8.5 according to the question. And now they are saying the Young's modulus has been given, calculate the extension of the wire. So you have to draw the model so that you interpret the question very well. Now, if I'm sketching the model, I'll show you the following. Let me first wrap up this part. It is a vertical wire, so it's a standing wire. When you're sketching, you sketch, you sketch it vertically upwards, like this. This is the wire that has been assumed to be fixed up there. Then we have the body attached. This body has its weight. The body is 8.5 G newtons. 
the wire has a tension in it. My rubber band is acting as the wire. If originally the body was stopping here, then this is the extension which has been produced. Our E. Sometimes we call it X. Okay. So this extension is the force in the wire. I mean, this tension is the force in the wire. So the original length, the original length was 350 centimeters, which is 3.5 meters. The first question wants the extension of the wire. They have given us Young's modulus is 2.0 and 10 power 11 it was missing, but that is it. Now, they gave us also the diameter. Diameter is 0 0.1 centimeters, which is one times 10 power negative three meters. Now the radius is 0 0.5 times 10 power negative three which is the same as five times 10 power negative four meters. Now I can find the area, which is pi r what? squared. Now from Young's modulus is equal to the force in the wire times the original length divided by the cross section area times the extension, we can make the extension the subject. So E is going to become FL naught out of cross sectional area times Young's modulus realizing the force. The force is the tension in the wire. Which force, which tension in the wire was it given? Yes, it was given, but indirectly. How? Because it is at equilibrium, the body behaves like this. Its weight 8.5 G is counterbalanced with the tension in the cable. So the sum of upward forces is equal to sum of downward what? forces. And with that note, the tension is equal to the weight of the body, always, whenever bodies are hung, unless when we come to a topic called simple harmonic motion, when they oscillate. So with that note, our force is the tension and is 8.5 G Newton. So we shall get 8.5 times 9.81 times 3.5 divided by cross-sectional area by times 5 times 10 power negative 4 squared times the extension. So it times the Young's modulus, 2.0 times 10 to the power 11. Press the calc and confirm the value of E. Someone give me that answer. We need to confirm whether it's the same as this one. One point eight six. So which is approximately the same as 1.9 exponent negative three meters, right? Then the energy stored, it's still got from the formula, a half K is squared or a half F is squared. Remember, if you do not have the K, you can get the K from force is equal to KE. Then you get K as F over E, if you want to use this one. But if you can as well use this, when you have force and extension straight away, just multiply K, I mean energy is a half times the force which is 8.5 times 9.81 times the extension which was 1.9 times 10 power negative 3. Then you can consequently get the answer in joules. Okay. 
So you can have that one down. And then you have some trial questions there. There are also experiments which are set in the practicals. From these cases of, uh, from the cases of symphonic motion by oscillating springs, from the cases of extension by extending materials. So a, a practical can come in this line in mechanics, talking about elasticity. Another one can come talking about symphonic motion. So it is always good for someone to have symphonic motion after having understood very well extension due to elasticity. Now, furthermore, uh, the remaining questions there are you yours to take a look at, especially for sketching curves and graphs. Now we have this as an experiment to determine Young's modulus of a ductile material. Whereby we have two scales that are used. We have a vernier scale and the main scale. The main scale is the one which is M and it is meant to, to read the value of the extension. Then the vernier scale is a reference scale that we use to check to see whether the elastic limit has, yet, has not yet been ex exceeded. So that's why we have the two scales. Then we have a scale pan with masses or with weights. Then we have this uh, main scale. It has a mass which is kept there, which keeps the comparison out. And uh, those masses are also put there to remove any, any kinks, kinks in the wire. The kinks are the wire, in the wire are those wrinkles which you can have like this cable is like that. When you put a mass, it straightens. So the kinks have been removed, the bends have been removed. That is why the masses are attached on the main scale. Now, how does it operate? Uh, two long wires, big Q, of the same material are suspended from a common rigid point. So this is the comparison wire. P, this is the test wire. Sure. Uh, the same material is suspended from a common rigid support. Initial loads are added to P and Q to remove any kinks, like I've mentioned, to make them taut, to make them straight. <clears throat> the diameter of Q is measured by a micrometer screw gauge at several places, and the average of the diameter is obtained. When the average of the diameter is obtained, it helps us to find the radius and hence to determine the cross sectional area. Of course, from that expression of area, as you can see. Then the original length of the test wire L is measured, and various loads are added in the test wire at the end, corresponding extensions caused a red off from the vernier scale. But after each reading, the load should be removed. Why? So that we see whether the wire goes back to its original position using the main scale. The main scale is acting as the reference scale. The vernier scale is the one which is predicting the extension produced. Now, the reason why we have to remove them is to check whether we shall retain or regain our original length or to see whether Hooke's law is still being obeyed. Now, implying that the elastic limit has not yet been exceeded. So the original length of the test wire is measured from the rigid support, the vernier scale, and the results are tabulated and the graph of load against extension is plotted. And its slope is determined. The slope is the Young's modulus, can be determined from the Young's modulus can be determined from the slope times the cross-sectional, times the length of the material, which is the test wire, divided by its cross-sectional area. Uh, then alternatively, we can also sketch float extension versus, versus the load. At first, I've, so I've said we float load versus extension. So if the reverse is true, the expression will look like that. Now, this experiment has some questions that normally state. They can ask you to explain the, to describe the experiment. 
two, they can ask you to, to do what? To give precautions taken when carrying out this experiment. One, the test wire should not, should be long. So as to have a measurable extension. Yeah. Then it should also be thin such that there is no need to use of bigger stretching masses. When it is thin, it is the extent. In each case, the wire is thick, which is difficult to handle, especially if you're using a lab set. I had not known until I visited uh, steel milling machines and industries in ginger, where I saw people converting rock stone, magnetic iron. I saw magnetic iron for, my, for the first time. Magnetic iron is like stone, they are black stones, but they are made from, they are got from different stones uh, from Cassese, and then they are boiled in a furnace to create metal. They are called magnetic iron because those, those stones can be attracted by a magnet, carries them, then puts them in a what? In a furnace to be burned, then to liquidify, and then they are cooled through uh, water running through cooling fins, then they form metal. But whichever metal, whichever size of a metal that is produced or you've ever seen, however big, it goes to a test lab. And there is a machine which tests its strength to see whether the standards which are predicted are still maintained. I saw a machine that was breaking a piece of iron bar as big as my hand. But when it is getting cut to be split into pieces, the blast you get is like a bullet, which you hear from maybe somewhere being shot. And when they remove it, it is very hot, explaining what happens whenever someone is doing what? Someone is stretching a material in terms of what we shall call work hardening. So with that regard, every material has to be tested. So even here, we have to check and see whether the material we have has not lost what we had before. Then two identical wires are used to eliminate errors that would result due to changes in position, due to the bending of the rigid support or the yielding support when the loads are added to two one. It also eliminates the errors due to changes in temperature. So you have to use two similar wires or identical wires. They are identical, everything about them is the same. Same Young's modulus, same elasticity, constant, same, same uh, proportionality constant, same thickness, same diameter. So everything is the same if they are identical. Now, here Mr. Kauma said it is for a student to establish why the wire should be free from kinks at first. Yeah? So who can think of why do we have to remove the kinks? Who can answer that question? Because I told you one of the reasons why masses are added in the beginning, to remove any kinks. Why do we remove the kinks first? Can someone give me an explanation why the kinks are necessary to be removed? You will see that if those kinks are not removed, eh, they will alter with the values of the extensions produced. So you have to make sure that the kinks are no more. Yeah? Then you can be in position to go ahead and attach your masses so that you get the correct, correct uh, extension readings as per what you have. So this is our graph of stress versus strain ductile material, same as the force versus extension for an elastic material. Yeah, so you see the first straight line is the elastic deformation region, whereby the material goes on extending up to point A, where it loses the proportionality limit. Remember I mentioned the proportionality limit is A, then we said L, L I had called it B, is the elastic limit, B, is the yield point, C is the maximum breaking or maximum stress point, and then D, the wire breaks. So the explanation still will go through it using that right arm.
which I had already talked about. Uh, other methods of deriving energy stored in a wire, you can get the average energy, I mean the average force. That is uh, before the wire has no force acting on it and after there is a force F acting on it. So the average force becomes a half F. So that average force times the extension produced gives you the work done. So that can also be one way you can derive the expression for energy. So, what? so they are basically around three methods. The first one is integration. Two is area under graph. Now three using the average force. So all those you can use them as definitions. Anyone, they say derived energy using the graphical method I showed you. Derived energy using work done to move a body or to move a material through a small distance X. Then they're asking you to use integration. They say, find or derive an expression for work done of analysis material using the average force. Then here we go. Okay. So in case you have the force and you have the Young's modulus, you can make the force the subject and express it in terms of Young's modulus. When you do so, see what you arrive at. We had already seen that Young's modulus, I called it Y, is equal to force times L out of AE. If I make force the subject, I'll have Y AE over L. But we have already seen work done is equal to R half times force times the extension, which is R half times Y times A times E out of L times E. This will give me a half times Young's modulus. Times the extension squared times the cross-section area by its length. Okay, which gives us the same equation. So it's just a matter of uh, making one the subject. The aspect of uh, Graphical method and integration, I also, I also showed you that already. I want to finalize with talking about uh, energy stored by unity volume. Whereby energy stored by unity volume comes from the energy stored divided by the volume. You look at energy stored. We have already seen energy stored is a half. K e squared or a half F e. So energy stored by unit volume will be a half of the energy divided by the volume. Then you realize this is a half times the force over area times the extension over the original length. So energy stored. By unit volume can be realized from our half times stress times strain. So this is an expression we need to use whenever we are talking about energy stored by unit volume. So the energy stored by unit volume comes from a half of the product, of the stress, and the strain. That is how we can write. So they can ask you to show that energy stored by unit volume is given by that three max. Three max, you start from there and give us the answer. More than three max, start from stress, brain, get the equations, then go ahead. And substitute there. Oh, get Young's modulus first in terms of stress and strain, then go ahead and substitute. So there are numbers there to try out as well. I wind up even my battery has gone down. Let me first talk about this one. Force in a metal bar. I trust you've covered the heat and there are some laws of expansivity, linear expansivity in heat. So if a bar has been heated up and it is fixed between two positions, 
and the bar is extended to a new length L plus L prime. Then the new length is got from the original length plus the original length times the coefficient of linear expansivity times the change in temperature. So if I get the new length minus the original length, I'll get original length times the linear expansivity times change in temperature. But new length minus original length is extension, which is equal to original length, expansivity constant, change in temperature. And if I divide both sides by L naught, I'll realize, what will I realize? I'll realize the following. I'll realize over L naught is equal to alpha delta theta. And in actual sense, this is strain. So the strain, when you have two metal bars being heated and there's a temperature change, maybe this way, this one is at temperature 20, maybe this way is at temperature 20, 45. So the change in temperature times the linear expansivity is equal to the strain. So they can ask you to find the strain. They can ask you to find the extension produced. Whatever they ask for, you can handle if you know this. But this knowledge is coming from it. Okay. Uh, so with that, you can look at some of these examples. My battery has run out. Eh? I get black out. So it blacks out before I'm done. Go through these examples. Then the other examples like these ones, I'll need to first come back up next week. My friends of Namisunsa, if you we are not busy, still we shall attend. But we intend to also have some special revision classes. They will be for free, I think. So we shall be saying like, today we have physics. Then you attend, we discuss with you. We discuss a paper, we send a paper, we try it out, we discuss it. Then we are discussing math, we send a paper, we discuss it. So these other numbers, these ones, they will need me to go through, through them. But you can try looking at them and inbox me in case of nothing, you don't, you, you, you're failing to understand. Then I see how I can come in. So the rest of the numbers, I'll take a look at them when we meet again next time. Otherwise, uh, even these further explanations remaining, I'll have to look at them we meet next time, God willing. Sorry, I had to take you very fast because uh, my time was not good, but at least we have tried to cover something on elasticity. So if we meet next time, surely we shall finish it up, okay? With that, we can call it off, unless if someone has a question. No question, my battery is done. Have a good evening.